worked the prison in a remote area in southern Iraq, miles from Umm Qasar. At the time I was there, it detained 30,000 prisoners and an additional 3,000 that no one except people working there knew about. They would put us in blacked out window commercial buses and drive us an hour away for days at a time to guard the facilities. We were never allowed to speak with anyone on the main prison FOB and forbidden to tell anyone about it. We referred to it only as Jurassic Park, one of the black prisons run by contractor medical personnel. The facility itself was a facade of mud and brick buildings, resembling a small village. The place was complete with villagers, us dressed up in man dresses and a small area for goats on the outskirts. From a distance, it looked legit, but up close, you could see the bulges from our combat gear underneath the clothing. All of us there were picked for our darker complexion and allowed to grow facial hair. You also had to be military police with TS and PRP, or Yankee White Clearance. I couldn't see Um Kassar from the facility, so I have no idea where we were. Just that we were in the middle of nowhere. We had to park the gun trucks and buses away from the area and use netting to cover them. The trucks were manned by a PMC, so they looked like civilian vehicles, beside being armored variations of normal vehicles. Usually a small fire team would be tasked with security and a turp. The rest of us had to put clothing on and start a small patrol to relieve the other guards. In late 2007, we were woken up early and recalled to go to the facility three days earlier than our normal rotation. We bitched, got ready, and headed out to get in the buses. This time around, we arrived to a lot full of newer up-armored Humvees, told to shut the fuck up and get in. There were already drivers in each truck, and off we went. The drivers drove in a tight group, which is unusual for convoy ops. They also didn't talk to us the entire ride. It's pitch black out, and all you can see is blackness. But this is the first time we were allowed to see where we were going, because the Humvee windows weren't blacked out like the buses. I'm trying to orient myself, but can't see much beside the little red lights of the vehicle in front of mine. The windows are thick armored glass, so it's impossible to see anything in the nighttime desert with no illumination beside the convoys. We drive for a little over an hour and you can see a faint glow in the distance. We start to get closer and it's the facility that's on fire. The lieutenant comes over our comms and relays that anyone not wearing American DCU pattern MOP4 is to be eliminated via deadly force. None of us are wearing MOP gear. The drivers stop the vehicles and we're told to dismount and rally around a group of LMTVs that are waiting for us. They start calling out SSI numbers and handing out mopping gear that is already our sizes. My WTF is going off hard. NCOs come around and tell us to gear up. We start putting our mop gear and are abruptly told to stop and strip back down to our regular uniforms and take out our military ID cards, driver license, and any other form of photo identification on our person or gear. Little teams of PMC, private military contractor, i.e. Blackwater and etc., start collecting and searching us. One guy would cut away our name tape, military branch tape, and unit patches. Once they finished, another team of them would come by and try to find anything the first one missed. Lastly, our NCOs did the same thing to see if the first two missed anything. Officers start rallying up our NCOs for the OP order, operations order tells them what the plan is, and the rest of us are told to rally back up around another set of LMTVs, armored supply trucks, like a new reduce and a half, and start unloading boxes filled with ammo, magazines, and newer NVGs than the ones we already had in our gear. These ones had a rail system that attached in beyond our optic so we could wear a gas mask and still shoot and see in the dark. We're told to load as many magazines as possible and put the spares in our three-day assault packs Fancy military for backpack. We already carried a basic load of 210 rounds and M9 pistols, with 45 rounds and our ammo patches on our IBAs, individual body armor. We're taken over to another area to zero all weapons at a makeshift little range made of HESCO blast barriers. With my NVGs, I can see that there's a security parameter around us made up of PMCs. We shoot, zero, then rally back up to hear what the plan is. We are to provide personal security for a team of contractors and are to follow any and all direction from contractors, unless it's basic combat tactical decisions. We start forming up into squads, 12 people, 
then break down into fire teams, about four people, and designate who will stay with the contractor, who will provide external security, and who will be clearing rooms. We then are briefed via rock drills, literally a fucking map made of rocks and lines and dirt, for which squads will assault at wet entry points or defend entry points. We're leaving in platoon size, about five squads, and the rest of our normal security detail will provide overwatch with heavy weapons and marksmen on the external perimeter once we start to systematically clear the village and underlying prison facility. After all that, a team of three contractors wearing those pressurized suits that push air outward when it rips joins my fire team. I want to say they had DuPont logos on the suit itself, but I don't remember. We start to move toward our objective. The patrol there goes smoothly, and we set up a perimeter and recon the area. Only a few buildings are still smoldering. The fire itself had gone out during all the bullshit of just gearing up. A majority of the village is intact. There are also bodies strewn about, but with the gas masks and only night vision, it's hard to make out if they are insurgents or the guys we normally relieved, wearing local clothing. There is a small IR beacon, infrared, flashing at the base of one of the larger buildings, and wants our team to shift to cover and clear that building. Plans are adjusted, and the assault begins. It is damn near impossible to move with all the mop suit on. That combined with sweat pooling in my mask and low visibility is making something relatively complicated in itself even more difficult. Fire teams make progress to their respective areas. Our building is on the opposite side of the town, so it takes us a minute to get there. We bound and take positions, making it even more tedious as we move. I'm running to take up the next position and eat shit into the ground, landing on top of a body. The face is caved in, and the gore gets all over my mask and suit. I notice he's armed with an M4, meaning he is American military, and there are shell casings and magazines strewn about his body. My guess is I lost footing when my foot hit the shell casings, and like marbles, they made me slide and lose balance. The guy behind me bounds up and drags me up by my assault pack back up to my feet, and we continue. Small arms fire is going off sporadically, but in controlled bursts, meaning that the other teams are running into opposition, but handling the situation. We arrive and stack up on our building and wait for the last team to get into place and set off two flashbangs to signal for all the other building clearing teams to start. I'm covering my area of responsibility, but can barely see shit with the sweat stinging my eyes and my inability to wipe it away because of the gas mask. The gunfire has quelled and the flashbangs echo throughout the village to signal the rest of us. I'm first in as lead man with my fire team. I'm having trouble seeing in the darkness and the fucking mask is making it worse. I swing my weapon up and clear my area of responsibility. The rest of the fire team follows. First room clear, so I stack back up on the next door and wait to feel the pad on my back to assault the next room. My eyes are stinging at this point and I really can't see shit. All I'm hoping is some prick doesn't get the drop on me and I get lit up. Feel the slap on my gear, shove open door. I swing right and see a silhouette in the corner. He first cowers away from the light coming from my surefire flashlight, then rebounds. I can't see if he has a weapon or not, but he starts to run towards me. Reach to squeeze the trigger, but the rubber from my mop gloves is caught on the trigger guard. Something so simple and quickly taken care of becomes an action long enough to get me killed. Two shots go off and my ears are ringing. The third man in saw the threat and neutralized it. We start to stack on the next door after securing the assailant with flexi cuffs. Contractor comes in and tells us to stand by. Walks over and starts fucking with a dead body. What the fuck is this friend doing, Dot JPEG? Starts swabbing the mouth with Q-tips and prodding the body with other instruments. I can't really focus on what he's doing as I'm responsible not to get us killed if someone comes through the next door. The other two technicians come in and start consorting with the contractor. The head guy walks over to my fire team leader and tells us to stop clearing immediately and stand by. Contractor gets on his radio and starts relaying a message to his people. Sitting there waiting, letting whomever it is waiting for us to get into position because they know we're there now and every minute wasted is a minute for them to prepare for our entry. I'm getting antsy thinking about it and want to keep moving but can't until I'm told. Contractor's radio goes back off and he mumbles something into it then addresses my fire team later. We are told that anyone inside the facility is to be considered hostile and don't try to identify weapons, just shoot. 
Um, okay, here comes War Crimes Tribunal, that MP4. Contractor tells us to continue. Get the door. Feel slap. Rush in. Room clear. This is the deepest into the building anyone has ever been. There's one last door with a keypad and a badge reader. There's a dead guard in the corner with boils on his exposed skin and black blood pooled around him and his clothing soaked through his clothes. The contractor follows us in when we secure the body. He repeats the process again, but doesn't call it in again. We wait in the room for a minute and wait for other fire teams to finish their way up to their respective entrances. Waiting and waiting. Then, one of our guys asks the contractor if we're supposed to shoot other American personnel. Hmm, what a dumb question, I think. But then this prick looks at us and says, Yes, anyone in this facility regardless of affiliation. What the fuck? I can't even believe I'm hearing this shit. Had it been our rotation instead of those guards, then the higher-ups would have just had us off too? With the downtime, I'm starting to connect the dots. Something biological was in this place, and now they're worried it will get out. My heart starts to race. I have blood on me. I'm wearing a shitty mop and symbol from some lowest bitter government contractor probably had made in fucking Puerto Rico. I'm starting to shake a little bit. My gas mask is starting to pulse on my face from the deep breaths I'm taking. I'm starting to freak out. How well did my buddy Chex really check this fucking thing to make sure I'm sealed up right? I asked the contractor if I'm safe inside my mop gear. He responds, yes, nonchalantly. I yell at him that he has a fucking suit that looks like it's out of the movie Outbreak, and that's easy for him to say. My leader tells me to chill the fuck out. I proceed to chill the fuck out, sort of. Radio goes back off. Other teams are ready. Contractor walks up the door and takes out restricted area badge, swipes it, then enters his pin. Door hisses loudly and retracts backwards with a hydraulic whir. Enter next room, sterile. One-way glass to my right, little corridor, not really a room. Shove muzzle into one-way glass to break it in case someone is going to light me up from the other side. Muzzle makes contact, and the solid glass doesn't even wobble. The shock hurts my wrist. Continue toward end of corridor. Another keypad. Contractor does his thing. We assault into a long hallway, with rooms on either side. Fucking room-clearing nightmare. Contractor assures us all these doors are secure and walks ahead of us to a specific door. I can hear movement and voices inside the rooms. Realize they are where the detainees are kept in cells. Contractor talks to later. Contractor wants us to force cell extract the prisoner. We don't have any riot gear to do this. Have to do it anyway. Stack up on door and he inputs a code to open it. Door unlocks, rush in. My first in, I slip and am shoved forward by my teammates for the extraction. I'm knocked out briefly. Wake up back outside the cell. I'm covered in blood, and teammate is wiping blood off my face shield. Contractor is hovering over me and asks me to check the seal on my mask to make sure it didn't tear. Seal is fine. Doesn't even ask if I'm alright. Walks away, talks to sergeant. Look inside cell. Covered in blood and vomit. Detainee, dead in the corner. Over here, contractor address one of the techs. Tells them to stay out of the cell, and that he was hoping we would find him here and wouldn't have to go another block of the facility. Restart assault and get to the end of the cell block. Another keypad. Inputs code and we go in. The room is round with a guard shack in the center of the circle room. Cells align the entire room with another keypad door at the end. Some of the cells are unsecure with doors open. Vomit, blood, and shit line the walls and floor. Gate shack is one way glass. Can't see inside. Hear beeping from inside. American steps out. None of us have the balls to kill him. I recognize him. One of the guys I normally relieve, but why is he down here? He starts to babble. He doesn't recognize who we are behind the protective suits. Sees Contractor. Shuts up immediately. Contractor is waiting for us to react. I'm waiting for us to react. No one reacts. I lower my muzzle and look to Sergeant for guidance. He just nods his head. No. Contractor asks to speak with Sergeant and two other techs. Take opportunity to ask guard what happened. Tell him my name. He remembers me from doing changeover. Relays that four days ago, five of those fuckers came up and told us there was a riot going on. That the guards inside were being overwhelmed by. Said that we didn't need suits like them. That it was a precaution. They lied. We need to get out of here, man. Looking into his eyes, noticed their bloodshot. His skin is yellow. Gums pale. 
and he keeps rubbing his stomach. One of my guys start talking to him. He turns around to face him. The back of his pants are covered in black shit, as in fecal matter matting and hardening. He passes a long-winded gas, but doesn't even break stride talking to the other guy. Pauses. Looks at the ceiling abruptly. Snaps his head back forward and vomits all over the guy he was speaking with. He starts to talk again like nothing happened. Arguing starts to get louder behind me, between contractor and sergeant. Start to step back a little bit. Shit pants guard starts telling vomit guard to take off his mask so he can see his face. Vomit guard is freaking out trying to clean his face shield while crouched on one knee. Shit pants starts stepping closer to his crouched body and reaching for his mask. What the fuck is he doing? Start yelling at him to back up and leave the other guard alone. Ignores me. Throws up on guard again. Still reaching for his mask and they start to scuffle. Shit pants is screaming for him to take off his mask so he can see his face. I run up and hit shit pants with the butt of my weapon. He rolls off, gets to his knees, and continues to shit and vomit himself, screaming at vomit guard to take off his mask. I start wrestling with shit pants and screaming for sergeant to grab flexi cuffs. Screams are muffled because of mask. I'm on top of his chest, but he's still grabbing at my mask, trying to rip it off. He's biting the rubber face shield and screaming at me in between. Start freaking out. Rubber over boat kicks him in the temple. Black blood starts coming from his ears. He starts struggling more, but Sergeant saw us fighting and ran over. Now he's flipping him over and gets the cuffs on him. He keeps squirming around, see the cuffs digging into his skin. Vama guard runs up and we drag shit pants into an open cell and slide him in and shut the door. We and our gear are all covered in vomit, shit, and blood. Contractor says nothing to us, but stares. We all nod in acknowledgement. Shit pants is still screaming, tumbling around in the cell. Contractor had us all come to him, and the text says bluntly, if you want to get out of here, you need to listen to us. We have a ways to go, and I want to stay alive. Then walks off to the next keypad door. Sergeant yells for us to stack up. Stack up, feel slap, assault room. Five people mauling around in center, and look surprised when we enter. I fire, and so does everyone else. It's a security station, monitors, intercom system, and etc. Secure bodies with flexi cuffs. Sergeant walks to camera monitor and consults me. Says we can bypass a lot of shit if contractor tells us where we're going. Agree. Call over contractor. He agrees and looks over the monitors. Points to facility clinic and says we need to go there so that they can do their job and we can all leave. Facility is much bigger than expected. Contractor tells us first rooms we passed are just holding areas for new prisoners to be sorted. Emergency exit map and security room. Start to plan assault. Place is built like a giant square with several hallways connecting rooms, all the way to the center that makes up the largest cell block and aid station. Run rock drills using miscellaneous office supplies. Get confident we know somewhat of where we're going. Start to assault the facility again. Get lucky through most of it, but traces of running gunfights are evident throughout. Bloated corpses are in some of the security substations, and we're out of flexi cuffs. Begin using sidearms to ensure that they will not pose a threat. Get to a three-tier block. Decide that we will just assault through as quickly as possible to the other side, and try not to avoid getting bogged down. Open door and start beeline. There's a security station in the center, running toward it to get past and get the fuck out of that place. Door swings open, and prisoner with M4 steps out and starts firing at us. American steps out next and takes up a position of cover and starts firing. Hit prisoner standing out and open. Keep up suppressing fire on guard while my teammate runs down the opposite side to flank him. Tags guard. We all rush up to clear the security room. It's empty. Guard is still alive. Tells us they saw what we did to the other guard station. And the prisoners and guards that are still alive are armed and waiting for us. Sergeant shoots him. There are only four of us that have a shaky understanding of the facility's layout makes me nervous. No time to talk. Run across cell block to other door to next room. Continue through several more rooms. Careful at each substation, but haven't run into anyone else. Make it to clinic. Secure it, then set up defensive position near entrance to protect contractors while they did whatever they were doing. They finish and come out with flexi-cuffed prisoner. I'm getting more anxiety over this situation. Now we have to tote around four people while fighting a force that knows the layout of the structure. Prisoner isn't wearing protective clothing, but he doesn't look sick either. Start to understand why they need him. Begin assault through building. Have to cover new territory. 
as is the shortest point to one of the exits. That is an entrance that leads to another facility where we can link up with a fire team from original assault force on the surface. Start running through rooms trying to be more cautious but trying to get the fuck out as quickly as possible. Run into what looks like an ambush. The three who set it up are barricaded behind random furniture and bodies litter the kill zone. Start running through the bodies trying to get out. Keep weapon level with barricades. Get to the point where I'm running on top of bodies. Reach barricade. All dead. Still have weapons. Looks like they succumb to whatever everyone else is sick with. Vomit, shit, black blood, and something new with these guys. They look like their abdomens tore open from the pressure of the fluids inside of them. Their organs are black. Some of the fluid is a deep yellow. Keep running, getting tired, getting complacent, overheating, dehydrating, and nothing we can do but keep running. Sergeant is lagging behind us. We cover more ground and he stops and takes off his mask and throws up. I look at the contractor and he just nods his head. His skin is yellowing, aggressive looking boils on his cheeks, has that same deep red tint to his eyes, pulls M9, kills himself before we can even say anything. No time, start running forward again, hoping to make it to that door. We have three more rooms to cover. Contractor calls me back and tells me to stop. I know where this is going, so I put the M4 on him and tell him I'll kill both of us before I let him waltz out without me and my guys. Tells me not to worry and says we need to deviate slightly to decontamination rooms. Too tired to care and he leads the way. Get to rooms and they spray the gore off the suits. Sitting, waiting for remnants of the original prisoners and guard force to kill me while I just stand there like an asshole while this thing sprays a bunch of shit on me. But nothing happens. We all rendezvous in what he called a clean room to wait on my three other guys to get done with their decon process. Start to put gear back on and not paying attention. Gunshots ring out in rapid succession. Contractor has killed the other two techs and has gun on me. Tells me he can get me out of there, but I need to protect him when we get to the surface. Agree to it. He shuts off the decon and locks my guys inside to die. Has me put on one of the tech suits instead of my original gear. Takes me not to the door we fought to get to, but to an elevator. Nothing seems real. Go on autopilot and follow him. He knows the layout more than he let on in the beginning. We get to the elevator and he takes us back to the original mock-up village that hid all of this shit. Rendezvous with my original security element, hoping they don't recognize me through the face mask. Hilo lands and takes us across border to Ali Allah Salem Air Base in Kuwait. I'm smuggled out of the country and back into the United States. Contractor kept his word and I've kept mine. If I gave you my real name, it would say I died in a mortar attack in late 2007 in southern Iraq outside of Umm Qasar. I'll leave you with this, a clue, J376. Not in a woods per se, but I did spend about two months looking after a small dude ranch operation during the winter months. Be on a dude ranch in Rocky Mountains, northwest Montana. Small outfit, just getting started. Only operate during summer. Owner asks for volunteers to stay during January through February to take care of the horses and keep things in order. Dude Ranch has electricity and a phone line, but no internet hookup. The online stuff is handled by small office in town. Decide, fuck it, more pay, and I get to hang around, shoot guns, sit on my ass, and feed some horses. Little did I know, dot X. Starts off pretty chill. Use company card to head up to Costco and load up on food, because fuck dealing with that road more than necessary. Plan out meals and such. Have all the food I need for the two months, but forgot shaving supplies. Always forget something. Fuck it. By week one, I started talking to the horses. By week two, they started talking back. Went through three and a half spam cans of 762. By hand, use shovel and dug trench and tunnel network through the ever-deepening snow. Made a whole army of snowmen to fight in my own winter war. I am become the white death, that JPEG. I became a master of moving within my winter wonderland. Laid in wait beneath the snow for two full hours and attempt to attack, rustle, and hogtie doe deer for domestication. Briefly entertained the idea of using said doe as fuck puppet. Not saying I didn't entertain the thought longer than I should have. Nearly succeeded, Doe managed to break loose before I could finish the knot. 
I do manage to succeed in knifing Coyote to death one night, shoot others, and brain tan hides and a fur cape for other in a snow escapades. The days flow together. Time holds no meaning for creatures of the land. I have become one with the frozen woods. Spend more nights out of the bunkhouse cabin than in. Some nights in the hayloft, others restlessly patrolling the horse corrals. I see many strange things those nights. Some creatures one might call a skinwalker, a wendigo, or worse. I no longer fear these beasts, for I have become frozen death itself. From the snow-capped peaks of each building to the tunnel system beneath the snow around the property, I have absolute dominion. No beast from mountain lions to coyotes to mice escape my notice. I need merely gesture, and the horse herd moves as I command. The merest hostile act against a ranch is met by thundering death from my Mosin. I routinely catch small animals by hand, and either play with them for a short while before setting them loose, or silently dispatching them with my hands before they go into the stew pot. I have plenty of food, but who doesn't like fresh supplies? But, alas, all good things must come to an end. One morning, I hear a faint sound, one I haven't heard in a long time, like the fragment of a lyric to a forgotten song. Sounds about like that hibernating bear I found. As it gets louder, I realize that it's an engine. Fast like brother elk, I sprint. Up the frozen staircase I built to the roof of the barn, I see an SUV making its way up the road. It's the owner. I gaze down upon my crystal world, the shot, bayoneted, knifed, clubbed, and sodomized remains of the snowman wars, the horse herd looking to me, their leader, for guidance. All along the tree line, creatures both large and small, cowering beneath my flinty gaze, twin chips of ice peering out from beneath my coyote skin cloak. I am so fucked when he sees all this. Clutching my 9130 and sliding to the ground, I meet the owner outside, the main guest cabin. I'm close enough I could bayonet him, and must resist the urge to do so out of habit with the snowmen, before I attempt to speak and let him know I'm right behind him. A strangled grunt escapes my lips, startling him as he jumps around to the noise. My voice cracks in an attempt to say hello, from long under use. Thought I was going to get fired, and nearly did. But after he asked about everything that went on, and seeing that the ranch was in perfect order, he decided that as long as I showered, I could keep the look, and we incorporated a whole quote-unquote mountain man workshop for the guests. Teach them a little bushcraft, simple survival stuff, and I got a raise out of it. My face when even the skinwalkers have learned to fear me. Green tech some spoopy skinwalker stories. Alright. I would guess this was about three to four weeks into it. Barn was gambrel style. Loft has hay and feed storage. Snow piled to the sides, and with a little work, I managed to build a set of stairs to the peak and set up a small snow hut, just big enough for me, and my mosin, and some small snacks to lay down in. Had small windows all around so I could see the tree line in any direction. Being alone for that long does do strange things to you. You gain an intimate knowledge of everything around you. The moment something doesn't jive, you are instantly aware of it. Be chilling with my newest addition to Coyote Fur Cloak up on the roof, chowing down on some jerky, almost late afternoon, overcast. I can hear the soft movements of the horse herd below me, a faint knacker now and then mixed with their eating and breathing. Hear one of them give a brief snort, and the rest go silent. No movement. Glancing to my left, I can see one of the roans looking intently to the southwest, into the wind. An instant later, it hits me. A smell like rotten meat mixed with a teenager's gym clothes locker that got left over the summer, with some kind of a musk to it as well. Crouching in my snow hut, I pull out my monocular and scan the tree line on the other side of the pasture to the south. The last coyote I bagged was in that direction. I find the spot where I had skinned it out, and I know right where the carcass should be, but all I can make out from my perch is drag marks leading into the woods. I look down to the horses and can see them all still looking in that direction, not moving, no neighs, or even nervous wickering between them. Pop open the ammo can that I keep up there, 
grab a few fresh stripper clips to tuck into my coat, and slide down the slope I set next to the stairs on the north side of the barn. Snow ghost my way along the fence line, still keeping my ears open. The smell has faded somewhat, but the musk still lingers like greasy fingerprints on a freshly polished 1911 at a store. Make my way to the southern fence line. All I can make out is the faint indentations of where snow has fallen to cover my tracks from two days ago. Scan the tree line 20 yards away. Can't shake that feeling of unease. Decide fuck it and walk over to where the coyote was. I can see the drag marks clearly, right over the tracks of whatever grabbed it. Tracks are deep, but obscured by the drag and whatever took it left by the same path that I arrived. Cutting east, deeper into the woods, you go far enough and you hit the Bob Marshall wilderness. That deep, musky scent is still strong. Sticks in your nose, the olfactory equivalent of peanut butter stuck to the roof of your mouth, but not nearly as tasty. Can see from the way the tracks are spaced, whatever it was had a long bipedal stride, sinking almost twice as deep as my own boot prints into the snow. I fully intended to leave the carcass for scavengers and the like, but it seems we have a new player in the game. Made my way back to the barn. Horses are still fixated on the southern pasture and line. Figure I'll stock a few provisions in the hayloft. This marks the start of many a night, spent buried in the warm hay. Pretty used to the night noises around the place. Coyotes yelling, maybe a cat screech, and owls calling out. That's the thing though, I'm used to the noises not a lack of them. Dead fucking silence. Even the horses kept close to the barn are quiet as snowfall. Didn't get much sleep that night. That musky smell has finally worn off by about dark. Next few days were uneventful. Not a whole hell of a lot happening. Second wave of snow fascists attempted to take the stronghold, that is my snow fortress, and were repelled by a wave of glorious 762. But on the fifth day, a southeasterly breeze brought that musk smell slamming back into my nostrils. I crouched low and took a snow trench to the barn stairs and made my way up to my fort. Peering over the edge, I could see something moving by the tree line. Through the monocular, it appeared to be crouching low. From the red beneath it, I could see it had taken something down. It had dark brown fur covering it. At least, that's what it looked like. It stayed low while it moved. The head appeared elongated ending in a blunt muzzle, almost like a bear, but also like if you took a Rottweiler's head, took off the ears, scaled it up, and covered it in coarse brown hair. Finally had a good look at what it had nabbed, a deer from the look of it. Son of a bitch, that one was mine.x. Put down the monocular, bring the Mosin around, and decide to fire a warning shot. With the thundering report of my Mosin ringing through the pines, I keep low and watch whatever this is. It's up and looking around, still with a slight hunch, but this thing is big, like eight to nine feet tall, if I were to guess. After a moment, it grabs its prize around the neck with a single long arm and takes off into the woods again. I give it a while before investigating. Same MO as before. It left along the same train I came, drug the body along behind to cover its tracks. I would follow, but it's getting dusk again. Fuck trying to find this thing in the dark. At the same time, I'm pissed. This thing has the gall to molest my territory. A strange thought comes into my mind. This is my territory. I'll mark it how I like. Right along where its tracks go from the tree line to the clearing before the fence, I piss all along it. Took a steaming dump right in front of one of its footprints. Over the next couple of days, I wait and observe. The whole time I can't shake the feeling that I'm being watched as well. I'm also starting to figure out why the boss managed to buy this ranch for so cheap. Dusk of day three, I have my answer. In the bunkhouse making some cornbread to go with my chili, when I hear the horses start raising nine kinds of hell, two types of chaos, and a side of mayhem. Throw on my coat, grab my Mosin, and affix the bayonet as I charge out the door towards the corrals. I'm almost knocked off my feet by the smell first off. Smells like a Wookiee in heat, but I can't see anything looming out of the growing darkness and falling snow. I make it to the main coral attached to the barn, and I can see all the horses are panicking, shying away from one side of the corral, the one closest 
to the south pasture. Nothing in the pasture, but there is something on the fence. As I get closer, I can see it's a deer, or part of one. Can't be sure, but I would bet money it's the head of the same one that I saw it take a few days ago. Torn off the neck, just below the head. Prints are fairly clear in the snow. It didn't have anything to drag behind it. Looking to the tree line, I can see a form fading into the pines. Bury the head and get the horses calmed down. Head back to the cabin. Took me so long dealing with the horses that my cornbread is now an inedible blackened lump. This spooked my horses and made me burn my cornbread and it killed a deer in my territory. Oh, it's on, motherfucker. The next day, I keep an eye out, head towards the northern pastures, and manage to back another coyote. But I bring the whole carcass back with me this time. Skin it out carefully. Make sure to leave the guts intact. Save the hide for later use, and bury the carcass underneath some old straw to let it ripen. Two days later, I head out before first light, grab the now bloated and ripe coyote, and take it out to the southern fence line. Gather a few pine bows and use an E-tool. Did a bed to lie down in. Cover my tracks with the pine bows and line the bed with them. Open up coyote and leave it about 10 feet in front of me. Cover up my first tracks, fix bayonet, and chamber around and cover myself with snow. Now, the waiting game begins. Manage to get used to the rotting coyote smell after a while. Toes are cold, but not the numbness that heralds the numbness of frostbite. Thank God for red wings. At first, I thought my nose was playing tricks on me, but I realized that musk had returned. It's game time. Its footsteps were barely making a sound in the snow, with that musky odor getting stronger with each footfall. I had a hard time controlling my breath, kept wanting to hold it in, but managed to keep it even and low, even with my heart rate going through the roof. I could see it moving through the trees now, but my first thoughts on a bear-like or dog head and muzzle were wrong, and I realized where I had smelled something like this musk before. Long legs and torso leading to powerful shoulders. What I guess, at a hunch, was the neck of an oversized goat head, easily almost three meters tall. Black beady eyes with a malevolence in them, and stumpy horns pushing through the hair above its brow. I could see the greasy hair of its chin dripping with saliva, leaking from the corners of its mouth as it sniffed the air. Sounding for all the world, like an enormous set of bellows. It snorted out a fetid plume as it raised its head and looked past my position to the barn and ranch. Seemingly satisfied, it stepped out of the trees, crouched, and moved towards the coyote. I waited as it got closer. 30 yards, 20, 15. Sucking in as much air as I could, I leaped from my concealed position, bringing my Mosin up over my head and shouted for all I was worth. The sound that came out of me I don't think I could ever replicate. If I did, it would have to be in a life or death situation. Everything was contained in that scream. Every shouted order to fix bayonets and charge, every screaming balls on fire rush across no man's land, every howl of fury as blades met, and every roar of primitive fury that another dare take what is mine. Stopping dead in its tracks, I reared up to its full terrible height, almost twice mine in boots and coyote coat. Summoning up another shout, I shouldered the rifle and took a pace forward. How? I don't know. I was ready to piss myself with my own stupidity. This was something else. This was a force of nature. And I was going to stand against it? Damn right I was. Ducking its head, it glared at me with these obsidian orbs of primordial hunger. This creature was contesting its claim. Taking a step forward, it answered with a bellowed challenge of its own, the bass rumble of its howl threatening to shake loose the tenuous hold I had upon my bowels. Its own howl still echoing in my ears, I couldn't move forward. Everything in me was screaming to cut and run, but as I stood there gazing down the abused wooden length of my Mosin, the dings and pits in the stock stood out in the light. I don't know how, I don't know why, but I took strength in that. This weapon had faced monsters before, faced an unstoppable machine, and brought it to its knees. With a snort of its fetid breath, it moved to take another step forward. Answering with another Cro-Magnon howl, I strode forward, standing over the offending pile of guts that had become the line in the snow. A scarce few yards from me stood a creature out of forgotten legends, a nightmare made manifest, glaring at me with hatred. 
hatred, and something else. A low rumbling growl built that I could feel in my chest as its lips skinned back over foul teeth in a twisted parody of a grin, bearing teeth that had no business in even an oversized goat's mouth. A third primitive scream escaped my lips as I sighted just over its shoulder and fired my Mosin. Thunder and fire erupted from the old weapon, playing a modern counterpoint to my own ancient cry. Startled, the beast backed off a step. Taking my cue, I stepped forward, past a coyote, and raised a rifle above my head, and stretched upwards on the balls of my feet for as much extra height I could muster, screaming at the top of my lungs. For whatever reason, that was enough. Backing up and finally turning around, it stalked off into the woods. Somehow, Deep down in that primitive part of my brain, I knew I had won, but the rational part of my brain still wanted to piss myself. I compromised by keeping a steady eye on the woods and pissed on its tracks. I hauled the carcass back to the barn and burned it in a barrel, went and sat up on the barn with a bottle of whiskey for the rest of the day. Never came across another kill anywhere on the property after that. I found tracks, but never anywhere near the perimeter, clearing between the fence and the tree line. I even sighted it from a distance a few times after that, but it was always from a long ways off. But we gave each other a fairly wide berth. I made the barest mention to the boss after he had been back for a while, but he just chalked it up to all the other crazy shenanigans I'd been up to while I held down the fort for two months, but he wasn't really interested. I tried talking to a few tribal elders, but none of them wanted anything to do with me. That's pretty much it for spooky stories from that time. I don't normally comment on X, just lurk most of the time. But I saw this thread and figured, why the fuck not? I'll post. I had three different events. Might have to post them separately. Might not post all of them if I get tired of typing. I suck at green text by the way, so I'll just type it out. The first event I had when I was a kiddo, although I didn't realize it until I was older but my parents and school teachers did. Before 9-11, I was always, always drawing cities and would put the twin towers in them burning. Although I was like four at the time and had never even seen them or heard of them. I did this in my agenda notebook, on the desk, on paper at home, all the time. Nobody thought anything of it until 9-11 happened. And then everyone was very quiet around me. They would try to be really nice to me. They wanted me to draw something other than burning towers. They never told me what. They just told me to draw whatever I wanted. Don't really remember much beyond that though. Fast forward about a decade and a half. I find my old agenda notebooks in the closet and see 9-11 scribbles all over them from time periods far before 9-11. I finally went and asked my parents about it and they were extremely squirmy on the subject. But finally they had told me that I was drawing all of this before 9-11, and that they were hoping I would just forget. They had told me that my mother apparently predicted a bunch of plane crashes between the 60s and the 80s in excruciating detail, down to exact locations they would hit. Although she lost this ability when I was born. Apparently my grandmother and my great-grandmother had the same ability to varying other degrees. It's really made me question a lot of shit since though. To the extent that I seriously worry about my own thoughts. Story 2 Significantly after this, but before rediscovering this weird life event of mine, I had another incident take place. I had the day off and had gone to sleep. Although, once I had awoken in my dream, I didn't realize I was asleep. I lived out day after day, week after week, month after month in this dream that I didn't even know was a dream. However, it was not a good one. Eventually, at some distant point in the future, the space station was deorbited. I do not know if this was intentional, or if it was normal orbital decay, or if it was even the ISS and not just one of those Chinese stations. However, shortly after this, there was a limited nuclear exchange in which 36 nuclear weapons were detonated 
in the Texas Gulf region. I am unsure what happened with the rest of the country, though I imagine it was catastrophic. Services never came back. Shortly after this came airstrikes, no idea from who. It honestly looked like some variant of the Su-30 Russian plane. Only a few, however, before those two eventually stopped. About a week after this it got horrific. There were a bunch of anvil clouds that seemingly developed out of nowhere, and large spacecraft were seen in them, not emerging Independence Day style, but as if the cloud itself was some kind of portal, and these ships were sort of halfway loitering, halfway in slash out of the portal. These ships were large, angular brick-shaped, but had no real texture to speak of. They were sort of a solid stone slash slate grey, and just sat there. We never saw anything come out of them. All we remembered were screams, from everywhere. And these monsters that would peel the skin from children and parents and wear their skin. And they were perfectly capable of imitating the voices of the people whose skin they took. They did this to lure people out of the hiding spots and take them. Killing yourself to escape them would not work. They could reanimate the dead. Part 2 of the last story. If you killed yourself to escape, it would not work. They could reanimate the dead and keep you on some sort of life support for the sake of experimentation. I don't know why or how, but somehow I knew that if they took you, you were theirs forever. There was no escape. However, they also had large facilities on the earth. They looked like normal warehouses, but the ones who wore people's skin were inside these. They would liquefy humans in here and keep them in devices that looked similar to dryers, and each liquefied human was kept in their own, and we had a hand scanner we could use to find where our person's remains were, so we could steal them, so that they couldn't reconstitute their remains and make them suffer. Somehow we could reconstruct the entire person back to what they were with this liquid. However, the ones who wore people's skin had these large pools ringed with symbols that looked similar to Zoroastrian Dakmas. I don't know the spelling. And they would fill these pools with people's liquefied remains and bathe in them. And their children would bathe in them and drink them and they would try throwing people in, and if you fell in, then you were one of them. This went on until most of the human race had been wiped out. I do not remember most of what happened, as if this was a single dream spanning almost 72 years. Eventually though, their spacecraft was destroyed. Most of the life on Earth was destroyed. It had become a large desert. I remember there were still alligators though, and whatever had transpired had killed the sun. It was slowly dying, as if perhaps they had siphoned energy from it to escape. I don't know if anyone intervened on our behalf, but I think that someone did. But I remember I was walking with a girl in a blue dress. She was my wife. I don't have a wife in real life, mind you. Part free after this. But anyways, me and my wife in the blue dress were walking down the road. There was a small ditch on the left side, with a few alligators in it, and a line of trees on the other following the ditch. We were walking home, and there were bits of these spacecraft everywhere. The sun looked like it was setting, but it wasn't. Damaged or something as I stated in my previous post. But we finally got home, it was getting close to night time. I then remember her whispering to me very quietly. We need to be quiet and turn all the lights off or they'll see us. We did this, and saw lights on the horizon, slowly blinking out one by one by one. I don't know if the lights were really close enough or not, but I could swear I heard distant screaming. Like there was a reason their lights were going off, as though even in our victory, we were still being hunted. I do not know what our enemy was. We. All just called it them. I woke up after this and realized I had been asleep for almost 14 hours. 
normally I sleep seven and a half, and that this 72 years of mine had all somehow been a complex fabrication of my imagination. However, every single event leading up to this has happened so far again, every single last one. And I fear that either I am once again in the long dream, or that it has become reality this time, and we are about to see tribulation. All of this sounds ridiculous to believe whatsoever, I know. I still have two other stories about similar events to this if you're interested. Russian invasion of Crimea, Iraq falling apart and returning to a fractured state, Syrian intervention. The next things to come along are that the rest of the Middle East falls apart. Not just what we're already seeing, but Jordan, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, Iran, pretty much everything except Israel. Eventually a space station, no idea which one or when slash how, will deorbit. A war between Russia and the US is going to kick off. It's inevitable. Russia is going to invade up through Mexico. The red line is how far into the US they end up advancing due to aid from the native Mexican population, initiating an insurrection due to increased nationalism, and a weak quasi breakup of the US following a civil war. The green circle is a flashpoint where Russia didn't invade at first. They stayed on one side of the ship channel until finally attempting to cross it. And that's when things go nuclear. 36 nuclear weapons are exchanged in and around the green circle. I have no idea how many are exchanged elsewhere, as that is the last time we have internet or TV ever again. Many other electronic devices and vehicles still worked however, mostly older ones though, and for some reason as I said, the handheld scanner for finding humans worked. Russia does a few more strikes with aircraft that I assume were hardened against the initial nuclear exchange, although they very quickly stopped, as I imagine they likely ran out of fuel or some such of a reason. Very soon after this is when the ships arrived. They are able to reanimate the bodies if they're fresh. I don't think they can if they've been dead for a long time or in the ground for a while, but I think there's about a one week window that they still can. I wouldn't advise killing yourself though, obviously. I'm not sure what they looked like. They were always wearing human skin when I saw them, although it was sort of loose and they would walk upright like humans, but they could run faster than any human, and even faster on all fours. Even the child sized ones were stronger than any human. There was no way to kill any of them either. I don't mean that figuratively. I mean, literally in my entire time I had not seen a single one die. They had sort of a weird glow to them though, like you could see under the skin where they had glowing machinery or augmented body parts or, or something that was part of them. And some of them, the heads didn't look right, because you could see the human skin on them, but you could see four or five glowing white eyes under the skin. The only way to survive was either to run which was not advisable because they will catch you on foot, or hide until they leave. But even that wasn't too good, because they were extremely quiet and would just sit there and wait outside of doors silently until people opened them, and then they would take them. The only people who really survived were the ones who had already gotten to the middle of nowhere when the nuclear war went down, or those who had basically given away their own as bait to lure them away or well, they escaped. I would not doubt for a second that by the end of the 72 years, there were probably only a few hundred thousand people left on Earth, if even that many. My scanner isn't working so I can't upload anything I've drawn about this stuff without it being shit tier quality. But from what I can tell, their technology is compartmentalized, as in they have several tiers slash hierarchies of technology. Whether this is due to them being an amalgam of civilizations or not is unknown to me, but I think it might be a similar reason to just not wanting us to get their technology. I'm pretty sure the hand scanner was theirs, but, but it was based off existing human technology. Or maybe human technology was based off of it. 
I'm not sure. Most of their other stuff was absolutely useless to us though. There was no way for us to use it. Somehow, with these portals being open, they were siphoning some kind of energy that powered the ships completely different from electricity. Although I'm not sure they even needed the portals, to be quite honest. Without this energy, the pieces of their ships were literally nothing more than useless common metals slash alloys. They somehow underwent some kind of rapid breakdown without the energy source. I don't remember how the portals closed or how the ships were destroyed. I was in the middle of nowhere at the time. I'm almost certain, 90% anyways, that there is some kind of scavenger civilization. They wait for civilizations to wipe themselves out. Then it's like it's some kind of cosmic law that for the most part, everyone is allowed to pick through the remains. Which I think is what happened after the nuclear war. And I think someone didn't like this and kicked them out. But not before they damaged the sun as a final fuck you to humans and whoever helped them. As I said though, it was not fun. There was something left behind. I don't think it was them though. I think it was something else. It was something in the long dark that would eat people, but didn't glow and I never saw them. I just knew not to ever show any light at night time ever, and when it was night, we slept underground. Part 2 in a second. We slept underground, under the house, in case things in the dark came inside and found us. I think they were little more than animals, maybe something they left behind, but I don't know. I don't even know if the long dark was permanent or not, as that's when the dream ended. The sun was dying. It's also possible that in addition to this, it was nighttime, as it was that the sun had died or that they had moved an object in front of it to obfuscate the earth or maybe it was residual atmospheric debris from the nuclear war and everything else that had happened. I know for a fact that something did happen to the sun though, so it could have been a compounded mixture of these events. In addition to this, I remember one time during this dream, a different occasion, where I had gotten into one of the ships somehow, and I saw what happened to the people who were taken. They were intubated in their back in varying body parts, not too much unlike the Matrix. However, there were far more cables and other mechanisms that I had no idea what they were. But if you died, then these devices let them bring you back. And most of the people attached to these devices were spliced open, with organs showing or missing entire pieces of their bodies. There were a few people who weren't much more than heads with gore sticking out of the bottom, but they were still intubated and kept alive, and mostly just screamed. The inside of the ships was the same slate greyish color, but there were colors made of energy, perhaps as electronic interface panels of some sort, but probably not. It wasn't pretty colors though, just varying shades of white slash yellow slash light light bluish. It was very basic too. None of that HR Geiger alien style. The ships were very utilitarian in the design on the inside. Everything served a purpose, and only that purpose. No decoration whatsoever. In addition to all of this, I say Mexican uprising. What I mean is that the Mexico aligned with Russia and most of South America slash Central America. So this, coupled with Russia, allowed for a fairly robust invasion. The US had been weakened substantially already, as I said due to the internal civil war. Whether it is related to this election or not though, I'm not sure. Under normal circumstances, I doubt they would be able to pull off an invasion though. So we must have been fairly weakened. I know that the White House and the Capitol was taken by the People's Revolutionary Force. Shit name, but that's what they called themselves, or had grown to be called anyways. So, for the most part, the government had already been decapitated before the invasion. In addition to all of this, again, the invasion and subsequent nuclear exchange had all come about very quickly. I was out in the backyard with my mother putting white Christmas lights in the backyard as patio lights. I don't think it was near Christmas though. We had literally walked inside and my dad was laying on the floor watching TV and had said, 
Well, I guess we just started World War III. And not 20 seconds after that, the first flash went off outside near where we were, what would probably be the Pasadena area of Houston, followed by the large area of petrochemical plants on the other side of the ship channel. They looked to be fairly low yield, as though they were specifically trying to target smaller areas, but I don't know. We got the shock wave where I was, and our windows were blown out, but the building was still intact with little damage. I had never said they were glowing green under the skin. I don't think I did. They were glowing the same as their ships as a sort of white-slash-yellowy-bluish color. I don't have a word for it, but it wasn't an Earth color. I speculate on the machinery, but there were bits and pieces poking out through the skin, and holes in the skin, due to some people's skin going necrotic. The machinery under the skin looked like a very similar stone gray as their ships. The skin was pretty contorted on their bodies, in some cases though. As I said, multiple eyes covered by the skin sometimes. Or others where the skin didn't exactly fit them right. They still had mouths though, but I don't think it was for eating. I think perhaps it helped them grab onto people, or for the express purpose of killing or subduing them. I don't even know if they were technically alive or if they themselves were just biological machines. Some of them really seemed like they wanted the skin. As trophies more than anything though. They collected it, and some of them were wearing multiple layers. And as I said, I have no idea whatsoever as to why they would liquefy the people and put them in the dryer machines in the warehouses. Surely, they had some purpose, but I don't know. It could just be as simple as storage or perhaps some religious purpose of theirs. They seem to have some interest in Zoroastrianism, as I said. I don't know how even a breakaway civilization could fight them though. From my understanding, they were possibly the first intelligent species ever throughout all dimensions, or one of the first anyways. I can't imagine anyone from this planet could even fathom a way to fight them. It would have had to have been someone else out there, on their technological level. I have no idea what Skinwalkers is, can you give me a link? Part 2 after. The ship in that video looks nothing like their ships, sorry. They don't have digital displays like that. It was kind of like some strange form of hard light, formed out of energy or something. But it had solid pieces that it looked like if the hard light turned off, then they would just fall to the floor, but they didn't. They sat there in a static position. The ship had no windows whatsoever either and any reading anywhere was in the same light slash energy as the consoles. The best I can describe it is that the ship was as much an amalgam of a mash of technologies as one can imagine. It was just stuff that just simply looked out of place for something like that. Rudimentary tools along with energy, along with patchwork on the inside of the ships, as though they were extremely old, but at the same time they looked like they were made of metal and stone at the same time, if that makes any sense. I used to work in the plants and they could actually survive a low year blast fairly well, as they're built to survive the explosions of nearby units slash plants already. You might have to rebuild the control room and change butterfly valves and anything else with an electronic sensor, but most of the stuff out there that could be that sensitive is buried. My guess is it could only take about a month or two to get it back online. Assuming you had workers, and, and assuming the plant itself wasn't hit too close. That's pretty similar, yeah, except they don't drool. Although it's possible what you said, that they're controlled by them as scouts then. Perhaps some kind of brain implant or some such other similar machination, so I wouldn't doubt it. This is my best paint shop rendition of it, but it doesn't do it justice whatsoever. The things were massive and intimidating. Like, just up there in the sky, solid and unmoving. Never once did we see one move. And most of the time you only see like half of it. The other half is usually obscured by fog. I can't make it look like it in paint, 
but the surface is pretty much completely seamless, but it can open up. The inside looks like a mix of metallic stone and the energy when it does. I never saw anything come out though, but they would leave these things that looked like giant stone caskets on the ground below the holes in the ships, and the things would crawl out of them. <laughs> 